Okay, so due to testing and uh, because I did have some difficulty with some recording, um, I'm redoing this recording and including all, everything from Article 1 for this uh, current unit. So um, we'll begin with targets. Um, and hopefully you will understand, one, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, two, how a bill becomes a law, three, the powers held by Congress, and four, how the powers held by Congress influence our lives yet today. So let's get started. If you remember the um, last unit that we worked on and had a test over was about elections, and I picked out all the information you needed with regards to elections from the Constitution. So we're going back right now and picking up everything that did not necessarily involve elections um, from um, the Constitution. So we're going to get, begin with Article 1, Section 3. We're talking about the Senate here. Um, so we're starting with Clause 6. The Senate has sole power to try impeachment. Now let me step back a second and make sure you remember that we talked about prior to this that the House of Representatives started the process of impeachment. Remember, it's a process. It, doesn't, it just doesn't come out of the blue. The process begins with the House of Representatives. They vote to decide whether somebody should be impeached. If they decide that it is, um, there is a reason for impeachment, then, then it goes to the Senate, and the Senate has the sole power to actually try the impeachment. It's an actual trial. Now, if it is not the president, then in, in, in the person is not the president, either a member of the House or the Senate or even somebody from uh, the Judiciary Supreme Court, then um, the, uh, the process um, is just handled by the Senate alone. However, if, the, if it's the president, then the Supreme Court, or the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, then becomes the judge for this whole process, the impeachment of the press president. Okay, so um, then if after they've had this trial and two-thirds of the Senate agree to re that this person should be removed from office, then they are guilty of impeachment. Okay, so just remember that the Chief Justice only presides if the president is being impeached and that there has to be a majority of two-thirds of the Senate in order for anyone to be removed from office. Clause 7 says that if found guilty of impeachment, the, the president shall be removed from office. Important to remember that there's there that there's no nothing else to be done, uh, depending on whatever crime the president or anybody has committed. There's nothing else that Congress can do. Now, depending on the actual crime, uh, once the person is out of office, then there could be charges um, presented. But that depends on the situation. Okay, so. That is Clause 7. Now let's move on to Article 1, Section 6. Now we're kind of back into um, the um, correct order for what we're going to be moving, uh, to the correct order for the Constitution. So we're going to begin with Section 6. This still relates to impeachment. Um, and it kind of talks about the liabilities of Congress, meaning that Congress has, there are certain things they are, um, they can be liable for, and then there's things that they may not be liable for, meaning they, that if they um, do this, they are not guilty of a crime. The first thing they're talking about is members protected from civil or criminal or civil liability in the performance of legislative duties. This means that if a member of Congress is doing something, uh, creating a law or doing or investigating something that uh, might seem uh, criminal to someone, depends on what it could be, um, they, as long as they are performing their legislative duty, it is not a, a crime. And they cannot, they are protected from anybody saying it is a crime. Now, that doesn't mean somebody gets away with murder. 
not at all. They can, uh, and then, and that then is a situation where um, impeachment comes into play. But, um, for example, if a member of Congress has not paid their parking tickets, uh, they can't claim that's performance of legislative duties. They must pay their parking tickets. And there's any number of other examples. You just need to remember the fact that if they, they have to be performing their job, their legislative duties, in order to be free of, or, or to be protected from criminal or civil liability, which, which are crimes. All right, then moving on to the next one. To preserve separation of powers, no member may be appointed to an executive or judicial branch. What this means simply is, if you are a member of one branch of government, you may not be a member of another branch of government as well. You can only be a part of one branch at a time. So if by chance uh, the president, executive branch, uh, says to somebody in the legislature, I would like you to serve in my, in my cabinet, they can say yes, but they have to resign from the legislative branch. If someone is elected to or appointed to the judicial branch of government, if they are a member of any other branch, they have to resign. You can only be a member of one branch of government at a time. Now, the salary may be increased, uh, may not be increased during a term of office. Simply put, you can't give yourself a raise until you are starting a, a new term of office. So for uh, if you're a, legis or a House of Representatives, you have to wait until the, the, your uh, new term, which is two years. Uh, every, you, every, uh, sorry, every uh, legislative member, House or Senate, um, I'm sorry, House, um, they are reelected every two years that's when they're, they can get a raise. For the Senate, it's every six years. They have to wait until that new term of office before they can get their raise. All right, section seven. Now we're starting to get into how a bill becomes a law. So important to note that either the House or the Senate may introduce a bill. It, that is always possible. There isn't a limitation on that with the exception of one thing. And only the House of Le uh, House of Representatives can originate a tax bill. Senate is not allowed. Senate represents states. The House represents the people. And only the House who represents the people can originate or begin a tax bill. Now the Senate can amend, but they can't introduce. Both houses have to support in, in to become a law. And that kind of relates then to this next portion that I'm gonna talk about which is this, I'm just gonna scroll down here. Um, this has to do with um, when a bill becomes a law, it has to be in identical form by both houses and then signed or vetoed by the president. Now what this is being called is the presentment clause. And yeah, I do expect you to know this is the presentment clause. This whole section here has to do when a bill has been finalized by Congress and sent to the president, basically they are presenting it to the president to decide if he will veto or sign. Okay, if he signs, then it's a law, done. If he vetoes, there are some options here. Um, the Congress can come back if they feel strongly enough about this law and they have to then um, override his veto by two thirds vote of Congress. In other words, all of Congress, at least two thirds, has to agree to override. It's pretty tough to do. It doesn't happen very often, but on occasion it does. Now, there are some other options too. And if the president is chooses not to sign, for some reason he doesn't really like the law, but he is not, it's not so much whether he cares um, about its passage, he just doesn't particularly like the law. Then he can choose not to sign. And then there's a couple options here. If Congress is in session, meaning they're working, they're there, they're working, then the bill just becomes a law, it's done. It becomes a law and, and this generally happens after 14 days. 
The Congress presents the bill, and then 14 days go by, president doesn't sign, it's a law. Okay, if Congress adjourns or is in recess and no presidential signature, then it becomes what's known as a pocket veto. And the Congress cannot override. They have left, the, it, that's what it means, uh, Congress adjourns, they've gone. Like right now, because of it's uh, the Christmas holiday, it, Congress is out. They're, they have adjourned for the year. And so um, if they had sent to the president a bill and he didn't want to sign it, then it's a done. It is, um, it, it's impossible to override. And if they want that, uh, try to become a law, they have to represent it at some other time. But at this point, this is what is known as the presentment clause. All right. Now, what I'm going to go over next, then, is how a bill gets to this spot. So let's go there. Okay, the interesting thing was, when the Constitution was written, the, the Founding Fathers never actually wrote down how to make a law. They only wrote this part of it. That's it, this part of it. They only identified under Section 7, they only identified this. They left it up to Congress how this would happen. Okay, so here's what happens. And I'm just going to go through this. Hopefully, um, I can do this pretty simply. All right, to begin with, when uh, a bill is introduced, it begins with getting a number. And it depends on, um, it depends really on whatever the, um, Congress wants to do as to, uh, I'm sorry, my, I'm thinking ahead of myself. Let me start again. Um, when a, a, a bill is introduced, if it's introduced in, in the House of Representatives or in the Senate, it is given a number. And let's just say this number is, a, is two, the second one of the year. All right, so the House has identified um, their bill. It is number two. So now the bill has to be introduced to Congress, or to the House, sorry, to the House. Now, there will be a discussion. There will be, there'll, there'll be some decisions on whether they think this is actually a good idea or not. And, you know, they may decide it's not. And so the bill can die right there. It's done. Okay. There's nothing more that can happen. All right, so um, let me see if I can do something here. There we go. It dies. All right, now I made a mistake. Okay, so if it's dead, then there's nothing more that happens. But if by chance they decide they're interested, they want to, they want more, they want to know more, they need to discuss more, then it goes to what's known as a committee for discussion. And there are a ton of committees in the House of Representatives. They are there, and a bill will then be assigned to a committee that relates to whatever the content is of the bill. If it's about agriculture, it'll go to an agricultural committee. If it's about education, it'll go to an education committee. If it's about money, then it'll go to the Commerce Committee, or there's a number, it could be the Budget Committee. There's a number different of committees that it could go to. What happens there is they have a discussion. They may have hearings where they'll bring people in to talk about the bill, experts on information. Um, and th this can be a long, drawn-out process. It literally could take years. But as long as it hasn't died, it can remain an active bill. But the committee can also kill it, die. It can also die here. It can, and in addition, it can be um, rewritten. Okay, what that means then is they didn't necessarily like the language, but they liked the idea of the bill. So they rewrote it. And then once they had the, the process that they liked or the wording that they liked, then it would move on next to the House to vote. Okay? So then the House votes, and guess what? It can die again, right here. So it can die, I'm going to put it over here so it's clear. So it can die once again. But if they like it and they vote for it, then 
follow the line. It has to go to the next house, okay, which is, in this case, the Senate. Now, once again, we've got to have a number. So that number will be, let's say it's 45, okay, for them. And it's just whatever is in order. They just take the bills and number them in order. There's no special any kind of formula for this. They just number the bill, okay? All right. Now, then the bill is introduced here, okay? If it's introduced, then it's going through the same processes as it did here. It's trying to work out, you know, is this something the Senate is interested in? And the Senate may say no, and it dies once again. But if the Senate likes it, it's interested, then guess what? It's going to a committee for discussion. Do you see the, uh, the similarities here? Okay, it's the same process for both sides of the Congress. So we've got a discussion. Um, it goes to a committee that relates to the topic. And, but again, the committee may work on it for a very short while or may take years, or it could, yes, you guessed it, die. If it dies, it's done. Or they could rewrite it and often do. Usually that's what happens. It gets rewritten. Um, it's now no longer exactly like the House bill. It's now rewritten. And then it's um, sent on to the Senate to vote for it. Now, we got a problem. If you remember that in um, when we were talking about um, earlier, it's, it said that all bills had to be identical. And so for them to be identical, because you've got two rewritten, <coughs> excuse me, and it may be just a few uh, differences, or it may be a ton of differences. It really depends on how the bill is rewritten. And so they've got to come to some sort of compromise, and that is done through this. It's called conference action. Do not call this a committee. It is a conference action, okay? And their purpose is to make the bill identical, right? It can be and it has to be identical. Now, can it die here? Yeah, if they can't come to some sort of compromise, it can die. Okay, that's, I get it. It can die, all right? But once it's been rewritten and it's identical, this, and this is, this conference is made up of uh, sen uh, senators and representatives. And then together they come with, uh, up with the identical wording and then they send it back to the House to vote and they send it to the Senate to vote. And again, it can die. It can die. Okay, and if either one of these houses say no, it's done. But if they both like it, they decide, yes, it's worth it, let's send it to the, present, to the president. And the president can sign or veto or sign now remember this is that presentment clause um, okay and president does not sign or vetoes then if congress is in session the bill passes it becomes a law whoops and if congress is out then it's a pocket veto all right so here's the thing when and this is going to be on the test I will have this blank form and you will fill it out. You do not necessarily note, need to note that it dies, but you ought to, it's worth maybe talking about rewritten. Um, and you do need to identify the Congress or conference action, uh, House and Senate votes, and finally the president. And yeah, I want the detail. So expect that. All right, let's move on. All right, now we're at Article 1, Section 8, and these are the enumerated powers for Congress. These are extremely important. I will be asking a lot of questions on this in the test. All right, so enumerated powers are those powers that have been spelled out to Congress. These are they, what they are permitted to do. Not, um, uh, they're, they're not supposed to be doing anything else other than making laws that relate to these powers. Okay, so here we go. Clause, and these are one, two, three, four, all the way through. These are clauses. So clause one, 
has to do with taxes, the power to tax, to spend money for national offense and general welfare. This is a blanket um, statement here. It's all about keeping the country safe and running. Okay, general welfare, and that is a broad, broad term, to, and it covers just about anything. Okay, borrowing. There is an obligation to repay, but a country, our country can borrow, and we do. Um, I'm not going to put this up, but we are in debt to trillions of dollars. And the thing is, is here it's stating that there is an absolute obligation to repay the debt. There is no choice. You cannot what's known as repudiate. In other words, to refuse or recognize to or refuse to recognize or pay any bills. It's absolutely essential. This is just something that the Articles of Confederation did not have, and one of the reasons why they failed so miserably. All right. Number three, regulation of commerce. This is a very large, broad clause. It's known as, in fact, the Commerce Clause. Now, the Commerce Clause covers movement of people and things across state lines and every form of communication and transportation. This is broad. So it means any goods, any people. If you cross a state line, then you can, there is regulation for the Commerce Clause. Okay? Um, things, you know, Route 70 is a perfect example of Commerce Clause. We move goods and people every day by the thousands and even the millions across these lines look right on route 70. Um, that also this, this also includes every form of communication from the telephone to cell phones to the computers to anything that can that you use to communicate is also regulated here okay and transportation our big trucks that uh, travel, that carry goods, and for everything from food to um, paper to Christmas decorations, anything and everything that is moved in terms of transportation across state lines is regulated by this clause. The Congress has the right to make laws that have to do with anything along this lines. And that's this whole point that we're talking about. Congress, the powers of Congress, they have the right to make laws. All right, number four is naturalization and bankruptcy. I'm not sure why these two were put together, but they were, so we're going to identify it. First of all, we're going to talk about naturalization, which is the opportunity for someone who is not born here in the United States to become a citizen. This defines the requirements uh, to become a citizen, and the feds, meaning the federal government, can only determine who are the only ones who can determine who becomes a citizen. They have the right to deny someone to become a citizen because of past maybe problems, um, but they have this right. Now, um, if you were born here, they cannot deny you citizenship, but if you come here, they can. All right, moving on. This has to do with now the provisions for failure to pay debt has to do with bankruptcy. You can, um, you know, debtor's prison is no longer available. And so what's now available is the idea of bankruptcy, meaning these are the provisions. If you cannot pay your debts, how, does, how can um, this then uh, be resolved? And this is known as bankruptcy. And bankruptcy is, is then... Um, you can file for bankruptcy, and with that, then you have an opportunity either to repay the debt in a much smaller situation or um, maybe even have the debt removed. But you do not want to go there. It is not a good idea because it really messes with you for a minimum seven years and longer, if po and possibly longer. All right, moving on. Money. Money can only be made, coined, um, and issued by the by uh, the federal government, the Congress in particular. The Federal Reserve System has was uh, established to regulate money supply, meaning they are the guys that are responsible for making sure our economy doesn't fall apart. And so 
Well, Congress then provides the uh, opportunity to make money and issue money, and then they give the power to the Federal Reserve System to regulate and make our uh, make sure our economy is uh, working well. Again, that's all under the Congress, to, and they watch to make sure that things are running the way it should be. Hopefully, they're watching anyways. All right, the next one is counterfeiting. Um, this is punishment. It is illegal to reproduce American currency. And so this is all about, you know, you get in trouble, big trouble for um, counterfeiting or making uh, money, trying to make money to uh, use to pay for goods. Uh, counterfeiting can get you into a whole lot of trouble. All right, post office. This was established uh, as a system to ensure safe and speedy trans transit of information and communication. In other words, getting, uh, getting uh, information to different parts of the country or communi communicating to family, friends, to governments. This is all about making sure that that is taken care of and that it's a speedy transit. Uh, Route 40, uh, na the National Road, what we were been named after, that, came, uh, that was created as a result of this particular um, uh, section or clause in the Constitution. Now, there's also under this a punishment for misuse of mailboxes or misuse of the mail, sending inappropriate things in the mail or um, sending threats in the mail. All of this can be seen as a federal crime. Even if you're teasing somebody, you send something that is threatening in the mail, you can find yourself in a lot of trouble. So don't misuse the post office. Destroying um, uh, mailboxes is another thing that can get you. It can be considered a federal crime. You don't want to mess with people's mailboxes. Moving on, patents and copyrights. Many of you have actually been are actually guilty of violating this. The, this is a protection of copyright and patent protection of authors and inventors' work. If you have downloaded a, um, a movie or music illegally without paying for it, um, that you know anything that is not already noted as free. If it's free, obviously that's okay. But if it's not noted as free and there should be payment, you have you have violated and are guilty of this crime. So not a good idea. I would avoid it if I were you. All right. So this is this provides for protection of those things. All right. Create courts now. The only court the Constitution identified was the Supreme Court in, in the document. So what this then does is allows Congress to add additional courts as needed. They're known as inferior courts, meaning they are under, under the Supreme Court. They're not less, they're not um, poor, but they are just under. They do not have quite the power that uh, the Supreme Court does. Okay. It also sets jurisdictions and duties meaning what area of uh, control they have. For example, juvenile court is all about juveniles. Anyone 17 and under um, then is part of juvenile court. That's their jurisdiction. And the duties of that juvenile court judge has to do with juveniles. And each court has their own duties and jurisdictions, area that they work within. Okay. Let's go now to the next one, 10. This is punishment for piracies and felonies committed on the high sea. Every nation uh, uh, has these powers. And piracy is seen as uh, something that, you know, if you're caught uh, being a pirate and uh, you are killed in the process, you pretty much deserve it. There is very little um, that someone can do with regards to uh, uh, that on the high sea because it is, there's no country that has specifically um, has control of that particular area. The, the high seas are an open area, and if you are caught, uh, you can pretty much uh, be, um, you, you know, it's a felony, and you can pretty much be um, in serious, serious trouble for those. Okay, if you want to see a good movie that relates to this whole thing, 
Watch Captain Phillips. It really does a great job in showing, and this is a, happens to be a true story, um, and showing you exactly w um, how this works, that the United States um, over in, off of the Horn of Africa, not in, uh, in um, uh, country's waters, but rather outside of the country's water, and how this piracy was dealt with. It's a pretty good movie. It's worth seeing. Okay, declare war. Um, the Congress, both the House and the Senate, have to declare war. For a war to be actually official, the Congress has to vote for it. There have only been two wars that Congress have voted for. That's World War I and World War II. All other actions are known as police actions or um, just a presidential um, action. It is, they, they have been, uh, soldiers have been sent, uh, mostly on presidential order. And if a presidential, uh, president can, he's the head of the military, he can send troops out and they fight just like they would whether the war was declared or not. But for official, only Congress can do it. Okay. 12 and 13, I combined because they basically say the same thing. It's raise and support for Army and for Navy. In other words, they can uh, raise an Army, they can raise a Navy, and then they have to support it. They can send money. They provide money for the military. Okay? All right. To make rules for government and regulation of land. Oh, this is 14. To make rules for government and regulation of land and naval forces. This is all about uh, the military and that the government can make the rules that um, pertain to the military as well as the regulation of land that is a uh, part of could be part of the military such as forts and so on or it could be this even is used for regulation of land for parks so it's got a lot of this is a very broad broad topic here um, they make the rules also for naval forces Remember, there were, back then, there was only an army and a navy. There were marines, but they were under the navy. Okay, number 15. Again, this is part of uh, the general welfare and the uh, defense of the country. This is call a militia. Now, what they mean by that is call a militia to any kind of duties. A militia is, we, there's not many countries or states that have militia. There's like, I think, two or three. But basically, this also provides under... Um, states having like a National Guard or reserves and so if needed these can be called for any number of different reasons like for example clean up after a hurricane or a tornado or floods or uh, you know fires there have been especially recently um, the reserves and uh, National Guard have as well as the, the regular armies have been very busy with these natural disasters Okay, 16, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining. And this is the same thing for the military. Uh, the military can come called by states, but is subordinate to the power of Congress. So Congress is still in charge. They still control, um, although they can, with, uh, with states, work to see um, work that is taken care of. Um, after Katrina, and I know this because I went down and helped, during Katrina, during the cleanup of Katrina in New Orleans, um, the military were out in force. They were patrolling to make sure people weren't in these devastated neighborhoods um, stealing from houses that were not their own. So this is an, a good example. Um, there are many more. All right, 17, govern the District of Columbia. That it means exactly what it is. D.C. is under the uh, control of the... Um, the House, well, the uh, Congress. However, Congress has delegated to locally elected officials to run the area itself. Now, in addition, Congress also governs forts, arsenals, and other places obtained from states for federal government pur purposes. This is also connection to like things like parks, um, uh, military bases, and so on. There, and there may be other um, examples. I can't think of any right now. All right, the next one, 18, 18 is your final um, clause for the powers of Congress. And the thing about this is it's all about making sure that 
Congress can move beyond um, that day and time. This is about making sure that there's a there's flexibility in making laws. Congress can make laws which shall be necessary and proper. Necessary meaning meeting. Proper means appropriate. It's it's it is something that is not fly by night, but rather it is appropriate. Should be taken care of. So to to further explain, founding fathers provided for the future by enabling Congress to use any means it thinks reasonable to create laws that are needed for the current time. And that's important. That word reasonable is very important because they should not be doing things that have no connection to the powers they've already been given. They cannot take more power than they've already been given in the 17 powers above. All this says is, is that these they can continue to make laws they see are reasonable and proper, or necessary and proper, for that relate to the powers of 1 through 17. This clause authorizes Congress to enact necessary and legislation necessary to carry out the powers of other branches. And they, this is an example that was given um, to organize and even reorganize an executive branch. They have a lot of power with regards to that. Um, and but they can't once they've reorganized or organized, they cannot tell the branch what to do. OK, that branch has to work within their own powers. This is also known as the elastic clause. So it's all it's known as the necessary proper clause, but also the elastic clause. And uh, it's all about that. It can expand to cover any uh, number of powers. This Okay, and I'll read this. This, the so-called elastic clause, is the basis for all the legislative branch's implied powers. Now, we haven't talked about implied powers yet. We will. But you need to know, and what implied means, these are not explicitly listed in the Constitution, but they are legitimate because they are necessary and proper for Congress to exercise these powers that are listed here. Okay, they, it is appropriate for them to, to enact, for example, um, Congress had no thought of anything like cars when they were writing this document. And so, but cars would connect to the Commerce Clause, the movement of goods, okay? So they can make laws with regards to, let's say, speed limits. Okay, so they have the right to make those laws because cars cross state lines. And that means they have the right to make um, speed limits. Okay, so over time, this clause has been used to justify a gradual expansion of general powers of Congress and the entire federal government. So it's what it's done is allowed flexibility so that as the country grows, the, the Congress can grow with it, can can legislate according to its growth. Okay, so again, it's this is an implied power. And then I already said that there has to be a link to one of the 17 powers that we talked about previously. Um, this can be extremely controversial because then it depends on the interpretation of the Constitution. The idea is whether it's loose, a loose in interpretation or a strict interpretation. Um, and so, depending on the law, it can be very controversial. Um, oftentimes, it's seen as whether it's a liberal or conservative. Okay. So, all of this is, this is an extremely important uh, 18, extremely important to the ability of Congress to continue to make laws that are appropriate for our time. All right, we're almost done. Two more, two more slides. Article 1, Section 9, Slave Trade. All this is, says here is, is that the importation of slaves must end in 1808. There is no, um, there will be no more bringing slaves in out, from outside the country after 1808. It does not end slavery. It only says you can't bring slaves in any longer. All right, now, the next part of Section 9 is habeas corpus. This is also, and this is, and I should relate back to, this is restrictions on congressional power. 
So what they're saying here is um, this is a device by which jail people may require their jailer to justify their imprisoned court. In other words, you have to, you have to, you can't be thrown in court, I'm sorry, you can't be thrown in jail and, and not the charges be brought against you. It has to be justified. So they have to prove, those who have jailed you have to prove that you de deserve to be in prison or at least waiting trial. Then the next two, which is again a restriction, it's prohibition preventing of something called a bill of attainder and ex post facto. So let's define these. Bill of attainder has to do with a legislative act that carrying the guilt of an individual or group of people and punishing them. What this is, is saying that the Congress cannot declare a group or even an individual that they have committed a crime when all they've done is actually just been, been identified as something. Like, for example, a communist. It is not illegal to be a communist. It is illegal to do certain acts, like murder or espionage or any of those things. But to be a member of that group is not illegal. And Congress is not allowed to just say, just because you're a member, you're going to jail. That is not correct. All right, now the next one is ex post facto. And this relates that, or this declares that an act illegal after it has been committed or increases the punishment for offense already committed. It is, you cannot, in other words, what you were saying is, is if you are, um, let me use an example. I think it would better uh, describe this. Um, the first person who hacked a computer, okay, there was no law that existed about hacking or preventing hacking or that hacking was illegal. So that person actually did not commit a crime. Now, Congress eventually now has um, laws about hacking computers and stealing identities. And you can be now um, arrested for that act. But the first person who did it, there was no law, there was no punishment, and so therefore they got away with it. But once this law was enacted that you cannot hack, if they tried to hack again, then yes, they would absolutely be found guilty or at least arrested. Okay. Now, Congress cannot, and then and these are just additional parts to this, um, Congress cannot favor one state against another while regulating trade. Um, all departments and agencies cannot spend money that has not been appropriated by Congress and may not use money for any purpose except what has been specified. Okay, in other words, you can set aside money, but you have to spend it on what you say you're going to spend it on. In other words, Congress, congressmen can't go out and buy a house on money that is supposed to be used for the military. It has to be spent on those things that Congress has approved. So you cannot go out and uh, spend money, spend the money uh, on any just anything, but rather only on what has what for what purpose it's been um, approved. All right. Finally, no one holding finally at this. Uh, slide anyways. No one holding an office may keep gifts, titles, or offices from any king, prince, or foreign state. Just means you can't be bribed. That's the point. You cannot um, keep gifts, titles, or any offices. Presidents have whole receive gifts almost daily from different kings, foreign states, any. And those are not the president. They belong to the country. And so what happens, often happens, is those things are put in a library, um, and, but they, are, they belong not to the president, but rather to the country. All right, last slide. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, section 10. To protect national powers from state interference, no state may make a treaty, alliance, or confederation with any other country. They can only um, deal with our nation, and then our nation in turn deals with any treaty, alliance, or confederation. All right. Now, um, also, 
Without con consent of Congress, no state may lay any duty of tonnage, which means the imports. They cannot uh, tax um, imports coming into the country. Uh, they cannot keep troops for just themselves. There's troops that can be there, but they are national troops, not state troops. Um, have ships of war in times of peace, uh, meaning they own the ships. Nope. Um, and they can't engage in war unless actually invaded or imminent danger exists. Now, should Mexico attack Texas? Texas can respond, but they uh, may not, they cannot um, actually engage in war. They can't attack Mexico. So on. Okay? It's the federal government. All right, we are done, completely done now with Article 1. And this is what um, I'm going to be testing over this whole section. Um, and I'll be testing here, and uh, we'll have a quiz. Uh, we'll do some review, and then we should see the test at the beginning of next week. Okay.